Excellent. Thanks, Saf, and thanks to all the speakers. Um, some really, really great questions coming in on the Slido. So please keep them coming in and we will answer them sort of post event if we can't get to them now. So for, for me, that there's a number of questions about searches and emis searches, and it's probably just a, a quick one to if, if I could ask people uh, who are interested in emis searches, if you look on the resource section of the Health Innovation Manchester website, all the guidance is available there and you can use them outside of Greater Manchester as well, but I would note the guidance that, that's available there as well. Um, first question I'd like to put to the panel really is, um, so when, uh, when should a patient be referred to a lip, lipid clinic? Probably one for a, a seam, if you wouldn't mind starting. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a good question. Um, so I guess there's many reasons you might want to refer to a lipid clinic, but for today's discussion, where we're we're particularly focusing on on secondary prevention or, or tertiary prevention, depending on your definition. So these are people at very high risk. Um, in the past, before we had um, such new kind of therapies such as inclisiran, we would have referred everyone with an LDL. Um, above 3.5 or 4.5 uh, to a lipidology clinic for consideration of PCSK9 inhibitors. Uh, like Muzabal mentioned at the beginning, um, he was offered. And now we have Inclisiran. Um, things are slightly different with Inclisiran. We never had an injectable available to us in primary care. Um, there are still some things that we need to be wary of, um, and in particular, the triglycerides. Um, if the triglycerides are very high, above 20, um, I would that is recommended that you do refer uh, that person to, to the local lipidology clinic, or at least seek some advice and guidance from your local lipidologist. Uh, they may ask you to repeat blood test first off or they may ask you some more information or it could be very badly controlled diabetes for example or, or many other reasons why that is and if someone has a triglyceride above 10 um, and below 20 you should repeat it first um, ideally fasting if you're not in the MFT lab catchment area and if it's still above 10, then you should refer on to the, the lipidologist as well. And we, when we, we were coming up with this pathway and adapting the, the AAC guidance, we, had a, we did it together with a lot of the lipidologists present. And generally, they're all really nice people. Um, they also want to help. And they're all happy to offer advice. Um, that's what they do. And this is their bread and butter. So as we get more familiar with cholesterol and managing this, they are more than happy to help us out. So if there are particularly complicated people uh, with particularly troublesome comorbidities, for example, and stage renal failure, CKD 4-5, chronic liver disease, or, or quite a lot of hepatic problems where medicines suddenly get very complicated and use of medicine, which medicines when, and how um, that they are also a good cohort of people to refer on to lipidology clinics. And finally, we can't forget about um, FH either. So if you if you suspect FH um, with a very high total cholesterol, say above nine, um, you know that's that's when you should absolutely be uh, at least sending that referral, asking their advice on on whether they feel they should see the person or what, what we should do. Do any of the other panel members have any any other sort of short additional comments to make? Just, just to emphasize what Asim was saying there around the FH elements, because we, we miss a lot of FH actually. Uh, and 25%, 50% of these people will have quite bad outcomes before the age of 50, if not picked up on. So if we are finding those individuals, referral is uh, is really key as well. So yeah, just to add to that. Excellent, thank you. Um, next question, really, um, and again for those uh, GPs who are prescribing uh, inclisiran already, how easy has it been to prescribe inclisiran from from your point of view? So if I could ask maybe George or or Richard or or Andrew or Carly on this one, did anyone one of you like to 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 talk? 
George, you're the, looking. The, the, the process is uh, is um, is simple as uh, Andrew described it. Uh, 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 the complication is that it, it is making sure that that works in practice. So uh, it, it, if you follow, it's complicated, not complex. Uh, so it, it, it was making sure that people understand what they need to do and follow the process so that they can get the uh, uh, get the drug in and then get the additional money uh, that is required. There is a it's just a, a, it's not a simple prescribing thing, uh, it, but it is a it is a process. Once you understand it, it, it follows through quite easily. But initially, it it, it, it can create problems. Excellent, thank you. Any, any of uh, anyone else want to make a comment there? Asim or Richard or or Andrew? Yeah, just to say it's it's very similar to prescribing the likes of um, hydroxocobalamin, you know, B12 in practice, yeah. or maybe if you prescribe luproralin, uh, prostap, and administer that to your patient. So yeah. exactly the same sort of thing. And answering another question, yes, it does require a patient-specific direction, which is effectively what you prescribe the medic, the GP or the qualified prescriber is doing when they order it. And as I did mean to enlarging that a little bit so it's the same mechanism for reimbursement uh it used to be the old fp 34 d form but um sophie's given quite a good comprehensive description of the process in the um chat actually uh, for tonight Excellent. can i just add to that just in terms of if it is prescribed as an fp10 that reimbursement doesn't happen so it, it, it's just making sure that people aren't prescribing as an FP10 because then the patient's going to have to go to the pharmacy and if they pay for prescriptions, pay for the prescription and bring it back to you and then the practice doesn't get reimbursed that money either. So it is doing it through the way we do B12 injections and ProStap. It's the same process. So practice managers are very au okay with it. So it's, it's quite useful to get them involved from the start. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we've had a question about uh, fasting bloods. Um, so uh, thought we didn't need to do fasting bloods anymore. Are lipid clinics still asking for it? So who'd like to take that one? I'm going to take it uh, as right. a non-expert. Uh, uh, so my understanding, uh, and, and the experts can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Fasting bloods uh, are, are not necessary in 99.9999999999% of the time. Uh, uh, we get stuck on the, uh, and Andrew quite clearly described it, he described point two uh, of, 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 of the target. But to all intents and purposes, we don't need fasting bloods. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and I think that's my take home message. There are very, 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 very rare exceptions that the lipidologists will get really excited about. But from my point of view, I don't use uh, fasting bloods anymore. Excellent. And Carly, sorry, um, you've just come on onto the camera. So would you like to make a comment on that? Yeah, it's just to say, again, as a non-expert in this area, we don't walk around fasted, do we? So it is useful to know what our normal lipid levels would be. And certainly a lot of the Inclusiran studies have just been about um, random blood tests, not about fasting lipids. Um, but I'd agree in occasional circumstances, like if you're looking for a genetic cause, you would want to exclude lifestyle related stuff. So in those sorts of settings, fasting bloods, I could see how they would be helpful. And Asim, linking to the pathway, um, have you got any sort of further thoughts about fasting bloods? Yeah, I think, again, it's more complicated. And there's the, the, the standard use of fasting bloods was for eligibility. So when you're first seeing a person, rather than necessarily ongoing monitoring. Um, the standard way we get LDLC is by an equation. If your triglycerides, if you've eaten and your triglycerides are up and above two, that equation is not accurate anymore. And it actually underestimates your LDLC. So that means you could see someone with an LDLC, a calculated LDLC from a non fasting, which is 2.5, and they wouldn't be eligible for any injectables or anything else. In those 
cases, which might be the 1% that George is talking about. <laughs> um, I don't know the frequency of that, but in those cases, it's worth getting a fasting to see if that pushes their LDL up. That is if you're not in MFT. So if your lab can directly measure LDL as the MFT lab can, there is no longer any role for fasting apart from if the lipidologist asks you for some weird things. Excellent, thank you. I'm going to close the questions there. Um, I'm just conscious of, of time, but just to say we will come back to you in the next sort of week or so uh, to answer all the outstanding questions that we've had also and the, the questions that we've um, had prior to the event as well. So before Saf sums up, uh, Asim, have you got any sort of final sort of thoughts before we wrap up? Yeah, um, it's, it's been a journey for me this last year learning about cholesterol. Um, I still consider myself not an expert in it, uh, but I think there is some take home message for me is that there are significant improvements to people's outcomes based on their, their cholesterol and how we manage it, essentially. Thanks, Asim. And just, uh, just uh, to end, just from my point of view, I feel as though we're very much on the cusp of big change now in GM uh, for our Greater Manchester residents around CBD and uh, cholesterol management. And I think getting the message out there with workshops like this, hearing from our, our local uh, GPs and PCNs and what they're doing uh, and the physician associates coming in, it's just great to hear the partnership working that's going on across this and the work that the G Triple MG have put in to defining these pathways has been brilliant as well. So I'd just like to thank everyone in working in co conjunction together to get this really on the map for Greater Manchester. And I think uh, my, my kind of point would be all of you just to go and spread the word now uh, and share the slides, spread the word about what we're doing so that we can get this uh, normalised across GM.